الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان اليوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وإن الأصدق الهتيد كتاب الله تعالى وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته like to welcome you to another session from commentary on the forty hadith of Imam Al Nawawi رحمه الله and we are by the father of Allah on Hadith number 41, and the title is Hadith is Inclination Towards Tanzil or Revelation. And let's begin the recital of this beautiful hadith. Anabi Muhammadin Abdullah bin Amr ibn As radhiyallahu anhu said, "Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yikuna khawahu taban lima jitu bi." Hadith on Hasan Sahih, rawaynahu fi kitabi al Hujja. بإسناد صحيح. أبو محمد عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص reported the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said none of you truly believes until his desire is in accordance with what I have brought or subservient to what I have brought. This is a fine and genuine hadith as reported by Imam Nawawi which was related in the book Hujja with a Sahih Isnad. Please note that this hadith is in the book Al Hujja في تارك ال Mahajja, and this is by Nasr ibn Ibrahim al Maqdisi. Uh, however, please note that it is greater as we due to the narrator Nuaim bil Hamad. Now, as our tradition, we're going to go into the life of the narrator, who in this case is Abu Muhammad Abdullah bin Amr bin Al As, and perhaps it's very fitting that we also include him in this discussion of the Sahaba, particularly since we're looking at a Hadith class. And this is a very special Sahabi with respect to the Ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so this Sahabi, his kunya is bin Amr bin Al As. At birth, he actually he was named Al As, which actually means the disobedient one. So, which is not a recommended name. Okay. And when he embraced Islam in the seventh year of Hijra, the Messenger Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam renamed him Abdullah. So that's basically his name. And his father actually was the famous companion Amr bin Al As, the celebrated conqueror of Misr, Egypt, and much of the victory was due to his eloquent speech. And his father really was, mashallah, a very skilled politician and leader. And so the Sahabi Abdullah bin Amr bin Al As again, don't get confused with Abdullah bin Umar, maybe Amr, right, with the Fatha. And so when he embraced Islam. He actually embraced it one year before his father, rather on, and the Prophet Sallam used to actually show preference to the Sahabi because of the great knowledge, and also the righteousness that he possessed as well. Okay, and also please note that he was among the top narrators of Hadith. Okay, he recorded about seven hundred narrations, and I mean if you compare it to the narrators that we looked at so far, for example. Of course, the top, which is Abu Huraira, then after him, which is Abdullah bin Omar, then after that, Anas bin Malik, then Aisha bin Anha, then Abdullah bin Abbas, and then others such as Abu Sa'id al Khudri and the like. So he actually comes under them. However, Abu Huraira the An used to say, "There is no one more knowledgeable of the things of the Prophet Sallam than me, except Abdullah bin Omar." And many of these hadith were actually written. He had a sahifa, a sahifa, a sadiqa, and he wrote the hadith of the Prophet Sallam in this sahifa, this these pages. So most of these hadith which were in his sahifa, the sahifa of Abdullah bin Amr, were actually incorporated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. So he was actually one of the first companions, Abdullah bin Amr, to write down the hadith, and this is after he received the permission. From the Prophet Sallam to do so, because he asked, he said, "Ya Rasulullah, aktubu ma asma o mink." Call naam. Call to fir reda was sukhot. So Abdullah bin Amr said, "O Rasulullah, shall I write what you say from you?" And he said, "Yes." He said, "In pleasure and also in anger." Call naam. 
فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَنْبَغِي لِي أَنْ أَكُولَ فِي ذَلِكَ إِلَّا حَقَّ Beautiful hadith and it's a famous hadith. He said that indeed, whatever I say is nothing but the truth. Because this is the Nabi of Allah. He does not speak from his desires. He speaks only what is the truthful. Right? This is the... Even if you go to the life of the Prophet Amin, the signs were there well before his nubuwa, before Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. And so this is the permission that the Prophet gave to the Sahaba, the Sahabi and others as well to write down the hadith of the Prophet and this again bashes that notion that the hadith of the Prophet were not put down in writing, they indeed were. But there was an early time period where it was prohibited perhaps because this is when also many ayat of the Quran were coming down and this was an age of immaturity where the Sahaba were not ready or the Prophet deemed the Sahaba not ready to record the hadith of the Prophet But then in Madinah Munawwara, the, the capital city, this is where the, the calendar started. Then yes, now it's allowed. Do so as much as you want. With respect to the statement, this huge statement of Abu Huraira Dan, okay, that he, this Sahabi, knew more hadith of the Prophet than even him. Remember, that he resided in Egypt where there were less people to relate from him than in Medina. This is after the passage of the Prophet And a number of traditions related by him is less than that of the great companions such as Abu Huraira, Aisha, bin Abi Bakr, the Anhuma. So, basically, because of that logistical situation, perhaps, you know, if perhaps Abdullah bin Amr would be not with his father, but with the community in Medina after the passage of the Prophet that perhaps even he would have narrated more hadith than Abu Huraira Dan, and it's certainly possible, and that's what's suggested. But because of, again, the great distance between Hijaz and Misr, and those logistical situation, perhaps this is why we actually don't get as many narrations as from the top six or top seven of the Sahaba. But nonetheless, even regardless of that, I mean, in respect of that, he had many other great virtues, the Sahabi. So it is just fitting that at least we had a chance to discuss the life of this great Sahaba as we are closing this great collection of Arba'un. Okay, I mean, this discussing the Hadith without the Sahabi would be incomplete. So Abdullah bin Amr bin Al-As was one of the most intense worshippers. He was the most intense worshippers fasting for days without a break, going many nights without sleep, until the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went to him. Right. This is again as recommended by his father, because the father was a little concerned. The Prophet came to him and forbade him from fasting without breaks and abstaining from intimacy for his wife. Because when you're fasting all day, then this is a great strain on even your spouse. And his father complained to the Messenger of Allah he said, narrated Abdullah bin Amr, Have I not informed you that you offer prayer all the night and fast the whole day? I said, yes. He said, do not do so. Offer prayer at night and also sleep. Fast for a few days and give up fasting for a few days because your body has a right on you and your eye has a right on you and your guest has a right on you and your wife has a right on you. I hope that you will have a long life and it is sufficient for you to fast for three days a month as the reward of a good deed is multiplied ten times. That means that if you fasted the whole year, I insisted on fasting more. So I was given a hard instruction. I said I could do more than fasting, that fasting. The Prophet said, fast three days every week. But as I insisted on fasting more, so I was burdened. I said I can fast more than that. The Prophet said, fast as Allah's Prophet Dawood used to fast. I said, how was the fasting of Prophet Dawood? The Prophet says one half of a year. Yani he used to fast on alternate days, and this is in Al Bukhari. So he was also told not to read so much Quran as well by the Prophet, but to limit his completion of the Quran to only once a month. Abdullah said that he could do more than that, and then he was told to complete it every seven days, which he did. So, subhanAllah, he read the whole Quran every week, he used to finish the Quran. Not only that, of course, he had a very emotional relationship with the Qur'an as well. He used to say that to shed tears from the fear of Allah, from khashatullah, was more beloved to him than to spend a thousand dinar in charity. In fact, he lost his sight in the later years of his life as well. And when he was old, he would say, only if I had concession of the Messenger of Allah. Ya'ni, it was so burdensome on him to continue that fast of Dawood when he was old, but yet 
this was a commitment of the Sahaba to Prophet Sallam. When they made the commitment, forget about it. Even if it was to the brink that it was impossible to do, they would still do it. And this is the commitment of Abdullah bin Amr. And so he continued this really high, unfathomable maqam to be able to fast every other day until his death. For the Anhuma. So the Prophet and the Sahaba, they used to continue those good deeds. And we need to also continue to do the good deeds that we're doing and not let up, inshallah. That's why even those deeds which are small but regular, those are so beloved to Allah But these Sahaba, of course, rose to new heights with their ibadat. He also fought in several battles during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah. And he accompanied his father also in many conquests, including the conquest of Egypt and Syria, Sham. And he remained with his father until his father's death. So this is where he actually had some regrets about. He actually carried the banner at the Battle of Yarmouk and attended the civil war which broke out in the Battle of Safin. But he did not even throw an arrow and, or participate in the fighting. He actually... He said that he only attended the battle because his father warned him to do so and recalled the messenger's command to obey your parents, obey your father. And his father was actually very close to Mawiyya Radhan. So thus he was forced to attend. But yet he openly regretted his actions afterwards and even during the battle. During the battle he reprimanded himself. He left the sword in its sheet and did not shoot an arrow and sought much istighfar from that time period for his attendance in that battle. From that point on, he avoided being in politics. And after the death of Uthman Radhi Anhu, he went to recluse to avoid any political issues or disputes. So after the battle of the conquest of Egypt, he resided in Sham, Syria, or Syria, and returned to the Hijaz area afterwards. In terms of his death, there are various opinions regarding where he was buried, as whether it was Mecca or Ta'if or Medina or Syria, Allah Alam. So it's not known exactly where he passed away, Radhi Anhuma. And so this is the great life of this Sahabi, Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas of this Hadith, Bada Anhuma. Okay. So now let's go to the Muqaddim of this Hadith. Okay. So the main point that this Hadith makes is that the believer will not be considered as having fulfilled the obligatory level of Iman until he follows the commands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this is not just a legal fulfillment, but is a fulfillment of the heart that he loves what the Prophet commanded him to do commanded us to do. And he hates that what the Prophet has prohibited or made illegal. Okay. So even though, even though Imam Nawi states that the son of this hadith is authentic, it is actually weak as confirmed by many of the muhaddithun, including Ibn Rajab. So there are many defects actually in the chain. Okay. So again, we saw that Imam Nawi is a little lenient in terms of his Hukum in terms of a hadith, and we saw that this is perhaps the fourth hadith in this collection, which is actually weak. If its chain is slightly weak, based on ayah of the Quran, for example, then it was an opinion of the early scholars, such as Ibn Jarir al-Tabri, that it could be raised to Hassan's status. But here the ulama say that there's many issues with this hadith, particularly in terms of its, its chain, and also particularly one narrator, which is, in this case, Nu'ayn bin Hammad. Okay, so Allah wa But regardless, this is still a hadith which we can benefit from. Because just like in the case of hadith number 31, the hadith on Zuhd, the meaning of this hadith also is correct and has been emphasized in the Quran and strengthened by other ahadith as well. So furthermore, uh, Shaykh Zarabozo also points out there are sufficient authentic and acceptable evidences to prove what this hadith states. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 65, the following. فَلَا بِكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, But no, by your Lord, they will not truly believe until they make you Ya'ni, O Muhammad, judge concerning over which they dispute among themselves and then find within themselves no discomfort from what you have judged and submit in full submission. So very similar to the overall message of this hadith, number 41. Furthermore, in Surah Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 36, 
وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنٍ أَمْرًا أَن يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَن يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is not for a believing man or a believing woman. When Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter that they should have any choice about their affair. And whosoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger has certainly strayed into clear error. Balalam Mubina. So also in the two Sahih, the Sahihain of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, it is related that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى كُونَ حَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ وَالَدِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ وَالنَّاسِ يَجْمَعِينَ but none of you will truly be a believer until I become more beloved to him than himself, his children, his family, and all of mankind. Narrated Anas bin Malik in the Sahihain. Mutafaqan alayh. So that previous hadith is very similar to this hadith as well. So we see that there is great agreement in terms of the matan of that hadith. But the issue again is that with one narrator who in general the muhadithun have declared him as weak narrator. Thus, because of that, this hadith becomes weak. Nonetheless, the text and the meaning of this hadith is certainly very acceptable and sahih. Okay. So going forward, some lessons from this hadith where the Prophet says, لا يؤمن أهدكم حتى يكون هواه طبعا لما جئت به So it is an obligation. It is an obligation for every Muslim to love that which was loved by Allah and His Messenger, hate that which was hated by Allah and His Messenger. And if this love is increased to the level which leads to fulfilling the preferable acts, the mandub, the mustahab actions, then it is regarded as an additional level of iman. Remember hadith number 38. It actually is a pathway to wilaya, to becoming a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is very distinguished and very rare. At the same time, however, it's still a pathway to Ihsan as well. At the same time, in terms of the love, we should also hate and dislike which is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the extent that we should avoid all of the muharramat, the things which are prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger. Okay, so, true love, it necessitates that we have to follow whatever has been commanded by him and his messenger. And again, we see in the Quran, for example, the ayah which we've recited numerous times, which I think all of you should put to memory, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ قُلْ أَعْطِيُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and forgive your sins. Okay. And Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. Say, obey Allah and His Messenger, but if they turn away, then Allah does not like the disbelievers. Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 31-32. to So, and we mentioned that this is actually a scary ayah because Allah Subhanahu says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Because if indeed you are not following, right, you're not following the commands of what Allah and His Messenger stated, then really you're acting like a kafir, like those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intentionally. So if we have any beef, any issues, right, a chip on our shoulder with respect to some of the commandments of Allah and His Messenger, which are commanded upon us, whether they're commandments or prohibitions, then really there's a problem with our iman. It's a dangerous territory there. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِن If they turn away, because this is exactly what the disbelievers do. If they turn away, from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message is commanded. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love the kafirun. So there's a warning to those who are against the sunnah, who plead ignorance to the sunnah of the Prophet أَطِيُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيُوا الرَّسُولِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that same level in terms of injunctions because He is really a manifestation of the revelation because He has been guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the true believer is the one who, number one, loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu truly and sincerely from the heart. Number two, loves that which is loved by Allah 
and the Prophet ﷺ. And three, hates that which is hated by Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. So this love will lead one to act in accordance with these dislikes and likes. So if one acts contrary to that which is loved by Allah or hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then one has to repent and do one's best to fulfill the obligatory actions to achieve the complete love towards Allah and His Messenger. Our feelings have to be attached and in accordance tabi'an lima to be with what Rasul Sallam brought going forward. Okay. Misguidance from following one's desires. All sins, all sins and disobedience, ma'asiyah, take place when self-desires are given priority and outweigh the love of Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger. So Allah the All-Knowing, He mentions this in the Quran Karim when describing the mu'minun, the believers. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إن لم يستجيبوا لك فاعلم أنما يتبعون أهواءهم ومن أضل ممن اتبع هواه بغير هدى من الله إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين الله says but if they do not respond to you then know that they only follow their desires Okay. And who is more astray than the one who follows his desire without guidance from Allah? Indeed, Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Surah Qasas, Ayah 50. Okay. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that all the prophets also not to follow their desires because this is an example also for us to follow as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Dudu, inna ja'alnaaka khalifatan fi al-ard, fahkum bayna al-nas bil-haqqi, wa la tattabi'i al-hawa, wa la tattabi'i al-hawa, fayudillaka an sabili Allah. Allah says, O oh Dawud, Indeed, we have made you a successor upon the earth. So judge between the people in truth and do not follow your desire, as it will lead you astray from the way of Allah. And this is in Surah Saad, Ayah 26. So the suppression of desires is one of the requirements which needs to be fulfilled before any servant of Allah may enter paradise. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Naziyat, but as for him who fears standing before his Lord and restrains himself from the desires, restrain his desires, verily, paradise will be his abode, his home. Ayah 40 to 41. So going forward, following one's desire. So any Muslim, any Muslim who performs actions, that are contrary to the message conveyed by the Prophet ﷺ, violates any of his commandments and prohibitions. Anyone who does that is regarded as someone who is following their desires. And the manner upon which an individual reacts by performing an act is also based on likes and dislikes. And this reflects our desires, whatever we like. Okay. So if, for example, if there's something we like and it's opposed to the Messenger of Allah, we have to fight it because we know that this is the ultimate haqq. And if we do not do so, then you're basically following your desires instead of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam or Allah and His Messenger. Okay, So likes and dislikes are not the main goal. But the main point is not to be influenced by those likes and desires. And we are human beings and we are also influenced by external forces such as the shayateen, waswas, uh, those who follow the shayatinic path or shaytanic path. And then internally also we have nafs al-ammara, the one, ammara bisuhu, which is commanding us to go towards the evil, right? Commanding us to do evil things. And then we have nafs al-lawwama, the blaming self, to blame us if we even think about doing haram things. We are imperfect, but Allah subhanahu wa has given us the tools to combat that and to make our desires subservient to the ultimate guidance in the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if someone likes something that violates the Sharia, this person is following 
his own desires or her own desires. And if that person is influenced again by those likes and dislikes, this will lead to an action which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so in both cases, the person has full, we have full responsibility and accountability. Okay? And the main thing is again, not to be influenced by these whims, these passions, these desires to that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is against or contrary to. So it's also know that following desires is also a reason or main reason behind many evil actions, of course. And it is also a main cause of actually bid'ah, innovations into the religious matters. So someone who follows his desires without evidence for truth, then it will lead him or her to fall into bid'ah easily as well. The famous tabi, Muhammad ibn Sirin, who died 110 after Hijri, he said that the first to follow misconceptions are those who are following their desires. So there are actually signs. There are signs of those who follow desires. And one of them is pleading negligence, neglecting or turning away from the beneficial ilm and turning away from the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ, yani the sunnah. So those who turn away from the sunnah, this is a sign that they are following their desires. Because if you plead ignorance, then this is a petty, pathetic excuse that you don't know any better and thus you can follow your desires. Okay, so this is how we have to make sure that we do not make excuses, particularly those which are making excuses to follow Allah and His Messenger, those things which are difficult for us because of our limitations. We have to still do what we can do because at the end of the day, nothing can be better than attaining Jannah. Nothing can be worse than going to Jahannam, the eternal hellfire. Imam Shatibi, rahimullah, he says that the objective of the Sharia is to keep the Muslims away, keep us away from desires so as to make us sincere and honest ibad, servants of Allah. And furthermore, problems, ikhtilaf or mushkilat occur when people use tricks and deceptions to evade the rulings of Sharia. Again, playing games, making excuses which are not authentic. And this is again just with the intention of fulfilling our desires. So continuing, controlling our hawa or our desires. Okay. The Sharia, the Islamic law, okay, the law which Allah and His Messenger have laid down for us, these must be made as the judging authority you know, that all of us, all Muslims, need to respect and follow. And in order to do so, we have to fight our desires. Okay, so the issue is not actually our likes or dislikes, but the issue is the sins which result from our desires, okay, our passions, our loves and hates. Okay. An example of the one who follows his or her desires is if someone hears the Fajr prayer, but is too sleepy or lazy to wake up to perform the Salah. The pleasure of just sleeping, continue to sleep, and the dislike of waking up and making the wudu, getting up from the sleep. Now this is regarded as an example of following our desires. So everyone who likes to sleep, everyone likes to sleep, particularly if near end, REM sleep. But our desire will result in us delaying the faraid, the what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his messenger have commanded. Because this is a wajib. We all know that the prayer is a wajib and this is one way we restrain our desires and train ourselves so that we actually, our bodies, love obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an effort. But if someone is not used to that, following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger, then this is what's going to happen. Their whole body, their whole desires are going to be in concert with the opposite, ma'asiyah. Another example yet is of someone who is hungry or thirsty and who consumes not halal food. Okay, so here, individual, there's something which is haram, they're not dying, but yet because of their hunger, they're reaching for things which are haram. Okay, or, for example, their desire for something like khamar, ma'adullah, like wine or those intoxicants. Another example is the greed of money, you know, not being honest, cheating, stealing, the desire of greed. So there's many desires we have and we have to restrain them in the obedience of Allah. So our hunger, we fulfill it with eating halal food. And there are risk, for example, we spend money from those sources which are halal as well. And same thing with everything. Any action we do, we have to, it has to be in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thus, we need to make the sharia as the judging authority for everything that we do. Before we perform an action, we need to ask ourselves, is this based on the haqq? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also names and labels the Qur'an, what the names of the Qur'an is, al-Furqan, the criteria which distinguish between right and wrong. 
Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, he mentions numerous ways in terms of dealing with desires. In fact, he wrote a book called Rawdat al-Muhibbin, okay, the gardens of the, the lovers. And specifically, Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned 50 ways to deal with desires, subhanAllah. And even those who have already been influenced or overcome by their desires can use these methods to fight them. So it's never too late. Okay, until Moth comes, we need to do our best and reverse some of these bad characteristics which are in ourselves because all of us have evils, all of us have weaknesses. And we need to just strengthen ourselves and fortify ourselves with the hidayah of Allah and His Messenger, inshallah, so that we can tame an animalistic self and be in subservience to the revelation. Okay. So number one is to have yaqeen that fulfilling or acting on one's desires will lead to one's destruction and punishment. And this has been mentioned also in the Quran Karim, in some of the ayah which we just recited. Okay. Restraining these desires, however, will lead to honor. Okay. The one who restrains the desire, the garden is his abode. Okay. So it will lead to honor in this world and the hereafter. Number two, to know that shaitan is the enemy of the servants of Allah. Okay, shaitan, again we talked about his devices, his influences, right? He uses desires as an instrument to influence and enslave people. So these he uses against us because all of us have desires and he basically amplifies them. He polarizes them so that we're given a reason, a faulty reason, right? A very transient reason to fulfill our desires for pleasure. Whatever it may be, okay, whether it's playing a video game when our salah time is expiring. It's to drink something haram to please other people so that we can get a higher status at work. For example, attending a cocktail party where there's only wine being served. It's saying vulgar things to please other people. So, shaitan, he amplifies our desires and gives us additional false reasons to act on it. And just recall what happened to Adam alayhi salam. And Hawa, he tempted Adam alayhi salam with the illusion of this eating from the tree, you'll be just like the angels. Uh, have eternity in terms of life. So these false things he basically tainted Adam's mind and Hawa's mind with until they believed it and acted on those desires. But the Quran and Sunnah, these are, they're going to protect us from desires and guide us and remind us and also repel all evil. Number five, to know that falling desires, this is the main cause of the disease of the heart. And we again talked about so many of these hadith in this collection. So many of them are focused on cleaning our heart, enhancing our heart, protecting our heart. Okay, because it's all about the heart. This is the central organ which governs all the other organs as well and our actions as well. If the heart gets ruined, everything else is going to follow as well. Number six, to have strong resolution. Again, niya. Niya is basically intention. When you have good intentions, then you're going to act on those. So have good resolution to do good things. Number seven, to have sabr. Again, surah al-asr. Success is based on belief in good deeds and also patience and commanding others to do the good and be on the truth. The patience is one of those components of success or being saved. That's the whole theme of Surah Al-Asr, is to be saved. Okay. Number eight, to consider the consequences of also following desires as well. Again, the following desires, again, look at the hellfire. Right? Just look to your left. That's the hellfire. Look to the right and look above. That's Jannah. If you want to go down, just look down. This is what you're going to end up. Right? The pit, go up. It's basically eternal bliss and a blank check from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do whatever you want. Whatever makes your heart happy in the hereafter. That's when you can do whatever you want with your desire. But in the meantime, restrain it. Restrain just for a few moments in this life, inshallah ta'ala. Eternal bliss and do whatever you want. A blank check and much more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number nine, to reflect we have been created for a great mission which cannot be fulfilled without controlling our desire. We have not been created for play. 
We have not been created just to fulfill our desires, to be just happy. Happiness is not the goal in life. It is to have eternal happiness. It is to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger so that we can have the ultimate happiness because this is just temporary. Being happy in this world can cause eternal damnation, eternal sadness and grief and horrors on the Day of Judgment. That's the reality. And number 10, to know that desire spoils one intellectual reasoning as well. So desires can make us dumb basically. The aql weakens as well. So it messes up our thinking as well for the good. And this is what desires do. Because then we can't think clearly. When we're controlled by our desires, then our aql also loses potency in following the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number 11, those who follow desires will be weak in performance also of good deeds as well. Remember, there's two things which cause the Muslim to go down, which is shahawat and shubuhat. Shahawat are those desires which will eventually even cause doubt, but they weigh us down and they cause us to be misguided. Okay, so we have to, again, restrain ourselves with the haq. The haq clarifies any doubt. Good deeds and sabr are the solution to restraining ourselves. That's why fasting is so great. Fasting allows us to control all the desires. We are restraining something which is halal for us, food and conjugal relations and other things as well so that we can be prepared for the next 11 months of the year and in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a training period. So fasting restrains our desires. So sabr, patience, is a solution for desires. And the last thing is strengthening one's faith can only be achieved by seeking knowledge and performing the nawafil actions. So if you want to go further, you want to attain ahsan, then we have to go beyond the faraid, beyond the just those things which have been obligated and those things which have been made haram. We have to go higher level. If you aim higher, it's never going to be a problem. For example, on the, the exam, the passing grade is 65 and you're aiming just for 65. Guess what? If you sort of lapse, then then that 65 becomes 60 and you fail. Right? So it's not the smart thing to do. The smart thing is always aim higher. This is why we have the Nawaf as we discuss in Hadith number 38. This can be or will be the lifeline for many of the people from the Ummah just so that they can atone for the lapses and the far than the obligations that we had. So always aim higher. We should always aim higher and we should gain the knowledge because this is what also enhances our Iman and keeps us more guided. And do so right now before you get older, before our minds weaken. This is the time when we should fill ourselves with the beneficial knowledge instead of filling ourselves with the minutia and the junk which is out there in terms of information. Fill yourself with beneficial knowledge instead of the other junk. Like for example, when you have an email, you have the junk mail, right? So we need to only extract the beneficial knowledge from Allah and His Messenger and focus on harnessing that inshallah ta'ala and that will pay dividends. And also, you know, one part of knowledge also is to learn the Arabic language, learn the language of the Qur'an Kareem so you can even take the Qur'an, the Hadith, even at a higher level and internalize it higher as well. So altogether, this beautiful Hadith, Hadith number 41. So despite the fact that this Hadith is weak, its meaning is correct and gives us many profound lessons. And we've seen the various and numerous ayat and Hadith also which echo the same meaning and principles of this Hadith, Hadith number 41. And the main point of this Hadith is that a believer will not have fulfilled the obligatory level of Iman until he gains in his heart the contention to follow the commands of the Messenger of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised the one who follows the Messenger of Allah to also gain the love of Allah. Okay. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. What can be better than that? The love of Allah that everyone desires is just from following the sunnah of the Prophet which is also in complete concordance with this hadith as well. And this hadith also points to the importance of strengthening one's faith, one's iman, by controlling the desires. Okay, And this can be also achieved by loving that which Allah loves and hating that which Allah hates. And lastly, this is a very important task that we are required to do. In order to adhere to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will attain the pleasure of Allah and be honored in this life and the hereafter when we are true and sincere servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan for attendance. Subhanaka Allahu hamdik wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant wa sakfa kutubu ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.